Okay, we're starting a totally new subject here, although it relates to things that we've already done. It's the first unit of the new semester. Uh, we're going to talk about impulse and momentum uh, today. And um, I'm going to start this off by saying that, well, I haven't been lying to you really, but I haven't been completely honest either. Because I've been telling you that Newton, Newton's second law, let's talk about Newton's second law. Um, we've said that the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And that's true. So that part is totally true. But this really isn't how Newton expressed his second law. This is a simplification of what Newton said. So today we're going to kind of approach you know, what he actually said. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take Newton's second law and we're just going to rewrite it a little bit and express it a slightly different way. But, and it's really not that hard. But the idea that it's going to give us is profound. And it's going to give us our first great conservation law um, in physics. So, well, I, let's just stipulate that F is going to represent the net force here. Okay. Now, um, what is acceleration? Remember we said that acceleration, at least average acceleration, can be thought of as a change in velocity over the change in time. Okay, you all agree with that? It's the rate, acceleration is the rate at which I change my velocity. How many meters per second am I changing every second? Okay, and that's acceleration. Okay, well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this in here. And I'm going to say that acceleration is a change in velocity over a change in time. So one of the things that we can say is that if I'm applying a net force to an object, that's going to cause a change in velocity over a certain period of time. OK, now how much it changes the velocity during that period of time depends on the mass. The bigger it is, the harder it is to change its velocity, right? That makes sense. Well, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. And I'm going to multiply both sides by a change in time. So let's say we have the net force times time is equal to the mass times the change in velocity of an object. Well, so all I've done now is I've rearranged uh, Newton's second law. Now I have it in terms of force and time and mass and velocity instead of force, mass, and acceleration. I've just took the acceleration, <laughs> split it up into two parts, the, the change in velocity and the change in time part, and rearranged it like this. Well, now let's let's expand this a little bit. Whenever I have a delta, what does that mean? Delta, that means a change in something, right? And how do we figure out a change in anything? Delta x, delta y, delta v, delta a, whatever we've got. Whenever you see that delta, it's the final minus the initial, isn't it? So it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Well, I'm going to take that and plug it in here. And I'm going to express the net force times the change of time is equal to the mass times the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Now all I'm doing is playing Algebra 1 games here 
and using the definitions of acceleration and change in velocity. So really nothing crazy hard about this. Now I'm going to distribute the mass inside the parentheses here. Okay, and now look what I've got. I've got a, a, a quantity here that we're going to define. An object's mass times an object's velocity. And this is going to turn out to be really important here. And in fact, this is so important that this product of an object's mass times its velocity is, we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it momentum. And momentum, by definition, is equal to an object's mass times its velocity. So here's what I'm saying. Hey, whenever I'm going to use the term momentum from now on, I mean an object's mass times its velocity. So that's a definition of momentum. Now we've used the word, we use the word momentum in everyday language all the time, right? I watched the, uh, you know, the 49er Giants game yesterday. And we said the momentum of the game shifted back and forth. It was actually a great game. I feel sorry for that number 10 guy who fumbled it twice. But, uh, but anyway, um, just the way it worked out. But, and now in, in physics, we, we take words in everyday language and we use them in a slightly different way. I mean, a, a very precise way. So, um, when we say momentum here, we mean an object's mass times its velocity. And this has units of kilograms times meters per second. Now, this doesn't have a, a kilogram meter per second doesn't have a name. You know, we, we had a kilogram meter per second squared. We called that a Newton. Remember, remember that? There is no name for a kilogram meter per second. And I don't know why. I think there should be. How many units of momentum? do we have but but they never have they've never bothered to name this collection of fundamental units now we have a letter that we use to represent momentum now it would be nice if we could use m for momentum but we're already using the letter m for mass so we're going to use a letter that has that's not even in the word momentum. And I think everybody just got together and said, okay, what are we going to call momentum in our equations? Well, nobody's using the letter P for anything. So it's P. It's a lowercase p. So P, lowercase p, it means momentum, by definition is an object's mass times its velocity. So this is a big deal. So now I can take this definition now for momentum and apply it to Newton's second law that I've rearranged up here. And I can say, well, look, the force, the net force times time is equal to, well, what is the mass times the final velocity? Well, mass times velocity, mass times final velocity, well, that's the final momentum of the object. P final. Minus mass times the initial velocity is the initial momentum. And so now I've got a, uh, I could, I could take this final momentum minus the initial momentum, and I can say, well, the net force times time is equal to the change in momentum of an object. You know, final minus initial is a change in. 
So now here's what this means, and, it, and it's common sense. I mean, you, you, I think you'll, you'll get a feeling for it. If I apply a net force for an object for a period of time, I'm going to change the momentum of that object. Right? I'm going to change its velocity. It's going to change in velocity. The mass will stay the same, but I'll change the momentum of that object. And so there you go. Now, and this right here is very important. This little equation right here. The net force times the change in time is equal to the change in momentum of an object. This, is, this has a name. And it makes it sound very fancy and very intimidating. But look what it says. This is impulse. Well, we have a name for this. When you apply a net force for a period of time, we call that an impulse. You know, I mean, and that's another word that physics has borrowed from everyday language. Like if somebody's impulsive, you know, they'll just do anything. They'll apply, they'll apply forces to their lives for a period of time, okay, without really thinking about it. Anyway, it, this is called an impulse, force times time. So if I apply a net force on an object for a period of time, this product will be exactly equal to the change in momentum of my object. And the fact that an impulse acting on an object is equal to the change in momentum of that object has a name. We call this idea the impulse momentum theorem. So you'll see that impulse momentum theorem talked about, but don't be afraid of it. Just add this to add these two things to your equation list. And you can use these equations to solve problems. And momentum is a different way of looking at, at things uh, to, you know, to solve problems. Okay. Um, and now this is this is this next part's not in your in your book, but I just want to show you this because remember I, I started off talking about Newton's second law and how I I didn't tell you the truth that this is not how Newton expressed his second law. What he did is he took the impulse momentum theorem and he solved it for the net force, and he said that the net force is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. Now actually, uh, if you're in a calculus class right now, and I know quite a few of you are taking calculus right now, he really didn't even express it like this. He expressed that the net force is equal to the derivative, the time derivative of momentum the rate at which momentum changes. But here's what this means. A net force is equal to the rate at which I change an object's momentum. Now, if you go backwards, if you take this, and you go backwards, and you say, OK, well, put delta t over here, use the definition of momentum as being mv, and then you just go backwards like this, you, you, you'll get f equals ma. You have, you're making a certain assumption, though. You're assuming that the mass, let me zoom all the way out here. You're assuming that the mass is constant. Now, by the way, this is what I'm about to do right now is not a very nice thing. This is only for the students that are in calculus. If you're not in calculus, don't worry about it. And this is not going to be on the test. But it's very cool. And this is part of your everyday experience. You, you know, so I, I want to show it to you. 
and it's, I mean, it's going to involve the derivative. Now, for those of you in calculus, remember if we take the limit as delta t goes to zero, have you done limits before? Who here has been in calculus? Raise your hand if you're in calculus. Oh, really? Everybody's in AMA, though. Anybody in AMA? Okay. And the rest are AM? All right. Um, well, uh, this is a preview of what you're going to get in AMA later this year. Um, delta P over delta, if you take, let, let delta T shrink to zero, you get what's called DPDT. Now, this is just delta P over delta T, but the time is very, very, very tiny. You know, um, and then you have the net force is equal to the derivative of momentum, but momentum is m times v. Well, there's this thing called the product rule, and you know what? I, I think I'm going to stop here because nobody in here is in calculus, so. Um, but when you get, I tell you what, <laughs> those of you in AMA, later on when you when you get to um, derivatives, um, I'll, I'll show you how um, this gives you a result that's pretty cool. Actually, have you ever um, turned on a, a hose full blast and there's water coming out and it pushes back on you? This equation tells you why you get that force. It, it has to do with the flow rate of mass, but. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about that right now. So anyway, just to, to work on the, for, for the next assignment, um, this is what you'll need. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. If you apply a net force for a period of time, that will be equal to the change in momentum. Oh, one other thing. This right here is a product of force and time, net force and time, which means I, I can draw a graph. If I graph force as a function of time, you know, I can, let's say I have a uh, force is constant and then it goes to zero like this. Well, whenever you have a product like this, force times time equals this quantity right here, whenever you have a product is equal to another quantity, you can figure out what this other quantity is by graphing it and then figuring out what the area is underneath the graph. So if this is net force and this is time, you graph the force as a function of time, this area underneath here will represent the change in momentum of the object, which is very handy. This is a very handy thing to know. Okay, so that is uh, impulse and momentum defined. Now all we got to do is use these ideas to solve problems, which we'll do next. <laughs>